Oh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Weekend Wrap brought to you by Crowcast. Uh, what a bloody shocker. Um, I can't get over it. But anyway, we'll have a massive uh, talk about it tonight. Joining me at the moment is Macca. How you going, Mac? <laughs> I'm in the same condition as you are, Pete. <laughs> shell shock. Absolutely. Well, shell shocked and uh, not very happy. No. Uh, Nikki will be with us, but uh, she's just running a little bit late. She had some prior commitments, so that's okay. We'll uh, push on without her um, and tons to talk about, Macca. I, I mean, you know, let, let's get into the score roundup and then we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, start, we'll begin the healing process. Okay. Oh, well, it's been a pretty weird round all round, actually. Um, and g'day to everyone who's joining us on Spreaker and also on Facebook. Uh, thanks very much for your company. I hope you'll be entertained and informed this evening. Let's go through the scores, mate. Uh, it started with a weird result on Thursday night, Melbourne uh, caning Sydney, uh, really. Uh, 78 to 100 in the end, 20, uh, 22 points, but uh, Sydney looking pretty average at the moment. Not a very high quality game, and um, yeah, you're dead right. Sydney, uh, that's that's the one team we've beaten, um, and they did look very, very ordinary. So that probably puts our win back into perspective as well. But it wasn't a great quality game. No, not at all. Um, neither team going terribly well at the moment. Friday night we had uh, the Magpies getting up over a spirited Bulldogs that looked in doubt for a while there, but Collingwood getting up by 14 points in the end, 78 to 64. Not a classy game at all by any uh, uh, stretch of the imagination. It was it was just two sides that they gave 100% in terms of effort and because of that uh, they sort of made, they sort of neutralised the any flow from it from the other team, and it was really just a, a wrestle and a tussle. Yeah, it was. Um, with, with Grundy starring, absolutely starring. And Adelaide do have to go after Grundy, and they do have to take an open checkbook and get him to write the number in there and get him because Mate, how, he wins matches. How the hell are you going to convince an A-grade ruckman playing in a pretty decent team to come over and play for our rabble? Anyway... Uh, Saturday, you had a pretty good game, actually. The Giants getting up at the death, uh, 79 to 75. Uh, Giants just working into a little bit of form, Macca, and uh, uh, a pretty good win down there at uh, whatever that stadium's called at the moment. Yeah, I call it the Alphabet Stadium because I don't know what all the letters are. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, GWS, they, I did confess last week, they are my second team. I, um, my sons are disgusted because they reckon they've been given... Uh, a lot of freebie, free kicks when they start, and they have. But I just love watching them play because of the way they play. And uh, they were down against Geelong, but uh, they've got the class there to come up and overrun Geelong in the end and get up and, in a pretty tight game. So um, it, was a good, it was a very good standard game too. I enjoyed that game. Yeah, it wasn't bad, actually. Um, better than ours. Um, we had Essendon uh, getting over. Brisbane Lions will be disappointed with that performance. Essendon looked to have bounced back a little, but the Lions have been in good nick. So uh, to go down by 47 points, uh, they'd be pretty disappointed by that, 112 to 65 in the end. Yeah, they would have had to be disappointed. Um, although Essendon is starting to find their mojo as well. I, I did see some of this game. Um, not all of it, but some of it. Um, and uh, there's some very nice passages of uh, footy from Essendon, and they're starting to get their running game going again now, and they look a lot very dangerous when they do that. Uh, the Brisbane Lions, on the other hand, well, they got brought back to earth, didn't they? Yeah, I, I think they just got caught out by Essendon's game style. I, Essendon are very hit and miss, in my opinion, and, uh, you know, when they are allowed to, to run, they're, they're quite a quick team, and, uh, you know, I, I don't reckon the, the Lions did enough to counter that. Um, but they'll learn from that. They're a team on the rise, and uh, you know, all is not lost. It's an away, it's a, it's an away loss for them. So it's not the end of the world. 
Uh, speaking of away losses, Richmond had an away win uh, against Port Adelaide, 92-99. to uh, Port's been pretty disappointed with that seven-point loss. Yeah, they'd have to be. There's no doubt about that. Um, I mean, Richmond, we had a lot of good players, the top four players out. And uh, Port Adelaide, really at home, should have won the game. But I want to make a comment about Tommy Rockcliffe. Um, Tommy Rockcliffe is actually, I think, an impediment to their game. Um, and that sounds silly from when you're talking about a guy that gets so much of the ball. But he will go into the wrong position and call the ball and they give it to him, Which, whereas a quick kick forward rather than going sideways to Rockcliffe may have caused some damage. And, and I think because he's so hungry, stat hungry, and they uh, call him the pig in fantasy land, um, and I, I think he's, he's a little bit damaging to their team. Yeah, look, I guess I can see your point there. Um, I don't know whether they've got enough targets at the moment, Port, which is maybe why they're messing around with it a bit. But uh, anyway, who cares? Um, the Eagles got up in the derby against Frio, 69-56. to I didn't see this game, but uh, low-scoring affair. Uh, the West Coast getting up by 13 points in the end. Didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> didn't watch it. No, I didn't watch it either. By this stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Didn't watch it. I, I had a bit of that too, Macca. I, <laughs> I, I haven't done any video prep and my stats thing is like uh, uh, half ass. And I thought, you know, I'm sick of footy this weekend. So uh, anyway, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, the Sun's doing us a favour and getting up. Uh, also doing my footy tips a favour, which were pretty average this week. Uh, 59 to 57 over Carlton. Uh, sun's going all right. Watch this game, and uh, yeah, I think they're embarrassing us because they, before the season, they were regarded as the no, a team of absolute nobodies with no stars, and they don't have any stars. And they're just a mob of workers and uh, honest toilers. And uh, against another team that at the moment is a mob of honest toilers, so it was they were pretty evenly matched. And uh, Gold Coast uh, snatched the game as they have. In the last three games, and uh, in their three wins, rather, uh, right on the death knock again until it's to win by less than a goal. And I've done that three times now, so uh, well, I was very pleased about that because uh, you know, we, we've got that uh, first round deal with uh, Carlton, and who knows the way they go, and Carlton might, might end up uh, be winning that trade yet. Let, let's not talk about that. <laughs> uh, what's the difference between the Suns and the Crows, Macca? One big difference. Well, they're trying their guts out for a start. They seem to have a, have a system as well. Well, the biggest difference for mine is the age profile. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit when we get into the Crows game. Oh, good point. Yeah, um, good point. And the last game of the round, another surprise. Uh, Hawthorne are hard to pick at the moment. And St Kilda having a very good win for them by 5.74 to 69 in the end. Yep. Um St Kilda, another surprise. They've, they've won three of their four games too. And yet, again, that puts us in, we're in, the, in the spot like where we, where we properly uh, belong at the moment because Hawthorne beat us away from Victoria on our home ground where we're supposed to have this great bias. And yet they lose at home to a team that was regarded as being very lonely and a chance for the wooden spoon this year. But um, I think, again, you're talking... Uh, about effort and probably the point you're making too about uh, profile of the team as well. So um, yeah, to, to the, the the lesser teams like uh, Gold Coast and St Kilda, I think are embarrassing us. Yeah, well look, it's a very imp uh, interesting ladder at the moment. Uh, it's quite a scrambled opening to the 2019 season. Uh, we've got uh, about six teams on three wins: Geelong, GWS, West Coast, Brisbane, St Kilda, and the Suns couple of surprises there um, and then teams on two wins Fremantle Collingwood inside the eight and then Hawthorne Western Bulldogs Port Adelaide Essendon and Richmond uh, sorry es yeah Essendon and Richmond outside of the eight and then on one win you've got the Crows the Swans the D's North Melbourne and then on no wins you've got Carlton uh, but not a shocking percentage from Carlton so uh and they're travelling a lot better, you'd imagine. Well, you, I, I would, I reckon they're travelling a lot better than this time last year. So they are. There's no doubt about that. Um, their their last quarter has let them down in every game they've played so far this year. Yeah, but uh, you know 
they look like they might have a couple of wins in them this year, I reckon. So uh, interesting to see. But look, without further ado, because uh, we're here to talk about the Crows, let's get right into it, shall we? Oh, Macca, Macca, Macca. What was it that we were watching? Like, seriously, what were we watching? I, <laughs> I haven't seen the Crows play such a confused, um, static, uh, inept style of football for a long time. I really haven't. It's the worst. I mean, I know we had a terrible 2018, but really... Um, that was the worst game of footy I've seen the Crows play for a while. North Melbourne getting up in the end, nine goals, 17, 71, to eight goals, 11, 59. So bad kicking, particularly by the Roos, but under the under the roof at uh, Marvel, uh, pretty shit kicking really. But uh, the, the Kangaroos just made it a scrap, Macca, and as has been the case for a long, long time with our squad, we weren't up for the fight. And, uh, Correct. At the end of the day, we stopped working, we dropped our heads, we lost our composure, uh, we stopped running, and we got belted. Well, firstly, they, you know, the blueprint there is to beat Adelaide is, has been uh, out there for all, all teams to see, and they all know what to do to stop us, and no. our coaches are quite happy to oblige, we'll just keep you on going down the same path. But if we... But that, that you North, there, North didn't play like Geelong, they didn't play the template. They just cracked well, in. They just cracked in, Mac. They, well, did, they didn't try they, to. They the didn't try to. Ha- well, the one thing I could not understand, and it reflects on the way we're playing and reflects on effort and all the rest of it. But um, as I said to you off air, we, we, you know, we we lost in the back line, we lost in the midfield, we lost in the forward line, we lost everywhere. They were terrible. But one thing I couldn't work out is. How come North, North Melbourne could find space to kick a, a player to, to a player unattended? And we've got a whole over, but we can't do that. Because only one team on the ground, Mac, was prepared to run, and it wasn't us. That's what yeah, it boils down to. It has to be something along those lines, doesn't it? It's, oh, at, at the moment, I, I do, honestly, as I said to you, um, I used to see West Torrens in their dying days before they amalgamated, and they were bloody terrible and I had the same and they were hopeless and I had the same feeling watching the Crows uh, last night this is a pathetic team it just doesn't give and the coaching isn't smart enough there's nothing in it uh, I, I challenged my two sons to I'll give you I just something I want you to tell me three good things about our game uh, last night and they neither of them come up with one. Oh no oh, Alex Keith was probably uh uh, oh, sorry. oh, sorry, I did say Alex Keith excluded. Yeah, well, Alex Keith was probably the shining light, and we'll get to that in a minute, but you're right, mate. There was there was nothing to like about it. Um, Eddie started brightly, and I thought he looked like he might have been on, but he, he got uh, taken out of the game, and he's playing very high up the ground at the moment, Eddie. Um, yep. But aside from that, well, I mean, Riley O'Brien, I think, probably improved on his uh, first up effort. I think he... He still got towed up in the ruck contest, but I, I felt like he competed a little bit better and gave a little bit more around the ground. But, geez, apart from that, I swear. Anyway, look, mate, let's go through some head-to-head stats and see whether there's anything here that uh, jumps out at us. Uh, North had more of the ball, 394 disposals to 355. Um, our kick-to-handball ratio uh, was, as you would expect, uh, quite heavily weighted towards kicking because all we seemed to do all night was just chip it around. Um, they took 120 marks to 109 by us, uh, including 13 marks to 9 inside 50. Um, so their tackles tackles was the same, 51 to 52, but uh, as I mentioned to you off air, Mac, tackles inside 50, 10 to 3 in North's favour, we didn't actually make a tackle inside our forward 50 until the 13-minute mark of the third quarter after 21 inside 50s. That is disgusting because we were resting our midfielders up there as well. Sloan and uh, Brad Crouch spent time up there as well. Yeah, so the ball's gone in 21 times and on not one of those occasions has anyone been able to lay a tackle until the 13-minute mark of the third quarter. We had three tackles inside 50 for the match. 
Anyway, we'll keep going. Um, our conversion rate was obviously horrid. Uh, 44 disposals per goal and 18, nearly 19 disposals per scoring shot. As we mention every week, the, the benchmark is around between 11 and 13, so we were miles off. We were just so inefficient. Um, surprisingly, um, I know, sorry. Uh, yeah, surprisingly, uh, the clangers were fairly even pretty much because it, it was an inside tight game which suited North 53 to 57. But after having been smacked last week at the coalface, Macca, how how are these stats? Clearances, 31 to 19 in North Melbourne's favour. Contested possessions, 137 to 120 in North Melbourne's favour. So we just didn't want the freaking ball. Centre clearances, we only won five centre clearances for the match. They won 12. Stoppage clearances, 19 to 14, their way. They covered nearly 600 more metres over the course of the game than us. Turnovers were uh, similar, intercepts were similar, but it, it's our work at the coalface. It's our appetite for the hard nut. We don't have it at the moment. That's a, that's the beginning and the end. The other thing, the other thing that uh, I think stands out glaringly uh, is the fact Last year, I kept saying all year, I, I watched Port Adelaide and I cannot work out what their game plan is. And I have to be honest and say, I look at our our team this year and I just can't work out what we're trying to do either. Uh, if Whatever it is, it's well disguised and it's not working. Well, I think, you know, if you cast your mind back to the JLT match against the Giants, um, it was quite promising because there were two modes that we played in that game. One was quite a free-flowing game of, of um, you know, run and carry. And then we seemed to switch it up and we, we went into a chip uh, mode where we were just pinpointing passes and try to working through their zone, etc. And you kind of looked at it and you went, oh, this is, this is good. This is actually, you know, um, two styles of footy in the one game. Uh, finally, they've developed uh, a plan B. But it seems to me that we've come into the season and all we want to do is maintain possession. So all we want to do is chip the ball around. We're not using handball, so we're not actually moving the ball quickly at all. It's allowing opposition teams to set up behind the ball, uh, to get their defence set, and because we're uh, our disposal uh, isn't great and our willingness to run and spread isn't great, we're actually not making any progress with ball in hand. So it ends up being a pressure kick uh, to an out number or to an op opposition player or something like that. And then as we've highlighted with our defensive stats, the ball just comes out and we're all out of hard position. Ar yeah, it's hard to argue. One thing is, in, because I think you summed it very neatly there, that that's what's happening. I don't know what is supposed to happen, but that that is exactly what is happening. Yeah, uh, look... <laughs> You could question. Like we go back to to the selection table, and we had uh, we lost two. Uh, well, we we dropped two players uh, with skill and and both outside players. Paul Seisman, obviously, with a li little bit of leg speed and a long kick, and Bryce Gibbs, although he's been out of touch, he's the uh, he's the bloke that plays behind the ball and uh, distributes. That's his role. But we brought in uh, Cam Ellis Yeoman. Uh, who I thought played okay, but certainly an inside grunt player. Um, and it made you think, why are we bringing in Ellis Yeoman and Miles Baholke was the other one um, for when, when we're actually lacking any sort of ability to run and carry? And at the time, I thought, okay, well, we're anticipating that North are going to make it a, a, a game of grunt, which they did. So we're bringing in a few more coalface players and hoping that we'll beat them at the coalface and be able to distribute the ball wide. It never fucking happened because we never got our hands on the ball. <laughs> we didn't. We didn't. Um, actually, just living the memories of this game is being <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know. Do you know, I, do you know I sat down, Mac, I was... Bloody painful. Macca, I sat down this morning to cut up some video to show to the good people who listen and watch us on Facebook and I must apologise to the people on Facebook because I got 10 minutes in and I, I, I couldn't freaking watch it. So I'm sorry, guys, I could not watch this game to cut up some highlights because it just it just made me too angry. <laughs> but, so, 
if, if we look at the the players who are actually playing in the team, um, the twenty two players have been select, that were selected. There is talent amongst the team in, individually. Not trying to play as a team, but you'd say in, if you went through the list of players, you'd say yeah, he uh, before the season started, that's, he's a good player, good player, so on, and so, so on and so on. But there aren't any, or well, not many, good players at all at the moment. Once they start playing it in real in real life, and uh, I just can't understand why uh, our centre structures are so poor, and I can't why our entries into the forward lines are so poor, why our uh, clearances with the back lines are so poor and um, it's been the same week after week but I thought we hit rock bottom against North Melbourne because uh, as you said they turned it into a scrap they made it very they made it physically uh, a lot more demanding and you know we there was no response from us we we didn't go up the next uh, next level to to really try and beat it and no we actually uh, dropped our heads our contested ball yeah. fell off a cliff in that third quarter our contested ball stats and our clearance stats fell off a cliff. So we just did not have the capacity to 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 get in and get amongst it. We weren't prepared to roll up our sleeves and match them physically inside the contest. And as a consequence, they were able to muscle the ball forward. Uh, they got a little bit out of uh, Brown and a, and a couple of their other forwards. But basically, it was just a it was just a, a a matter of who wanted it more, and they wanted it far more than we did. What really hurts, though, is because I thought that last week, after last week, we would come out and we would want to, uh, fit, you know, put some fit, uh, impose ourselves physically and scrap to the death. But we were even softer than we were last week. Uh, there, there were periods of time in in the game last week where we lacked um, a physical presence, and we actually lost contested ball last week as well, Matt. That stat. So the signs have been there. Um, look. A couple of uh, pointers that I'd like to make. I, I wasn't against Miles Baholke coming in. It was a bit of a divisive uh, selection, but he'd been playing very well in the twos. Mm-hmm. But can you tell me what role Miles Baholke was supposed to be playing? I can't tell you what role most of them were playing. Sloan. I mean, Sloan was uh, stuck in the forward line when the ball was in their forward line. And he was, at, and I was looking for him for half the game, and he's, he's just not there. Well, um, so just just on Paholke, I mean, just on Paholke, right? The kid comes in. He's a he's a goal scoring midfielder, right? He's been playing uh, sort of midfield forward in the twos, and he's been hitting the yes. scoreboard, and he's been getting touches. Did you see him in the midfield, Mac? Did no. he play uh, once, in the midfield? Yes, I did. Yeah, I saw him at one centre bounce. Yeah, one centre bounce in the midfield. Did you see him play near the goal mouth? Uh, no, no. Where was he playing? Oh, I, I have no idea what Miles's role was. <laughs> and to me, it's like, well, if you're going to pick a bloke, you pick a bloke and play him to his strengths. We, well, I, don't, I think we, picked, that, yeah. we, we kind of picked him because he was the best performed SANFL player, and that's all well and good. But I don't think we picked him with a specific role in mind. You know, we didn't give him a run-with role. We didn't give him a goal-scoring role. We didn't give him a, an outside role. We didn't give him any role. It was just like, here you go, Miles, you're in the team and just run around sort of half forward. The poor, the well, poor kid had no role whatsoever to play in that game. Well, that, that, that's a fair comment. I have to agree with you because I don't know where he was playing um, and I watched the game I've got no idea. Um, Cam Miller's Yolman, I think his job was to tag Cunnington. Yeah, but they took um, him off. They took, they took Ellis Yolman off Cunnington. He did, he did quite a good job. Ellis Yolman well, on Cunnington, really yep. But then in the second half, he wasn't he wasn't playing on Cunnington anymore. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very very concerned about our co- our coaching panel, and I, we've spoken about this now for the last two or three weeks. That um, um, Ben Hart, for example, up in the forward line, now, since he's been the forward line coach, and with the, it must be more than coincidence that we our Forward line of 2017, which was master class stuff, is is now no. amateur hour. No, it's amateur hour now. Mac, I'm I'm telling you something that that it wasn't a master class. It was a structure that worked well because of the players within it, and uh, we've got a lot to thank for that 27, 2017 season for the form of Eddie Betts. 
because it allowed us to use Jenkins and text differently uh, when text was on the park. Um, but our ability to score goals is almost directly attributable to Eddie Betts's drop in form. And it's not I'm not blaming Eddie Betts solely for it not kicking goals, but what I'm saying is it's it's changed our whole structure because no longer can we play high and, and push back. Jo- uh, our forward line has never been a good traditional forward line maker. It's been a hybrid that we've made to work because of some individual ability. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you, but it, it was just one of those things. That, because also, yeah, you had the other two blokes that have been cleared to other clubs, and which uh, are yeah. out of that structure, and they had the X factor in them. So what we're yeah. left are the one, is the ones that haven't got the X factor apart from Eddie. But but what what was the key to that whole thing? It was our rebound off half back, if you recall. Yeah. Our ability to move the ball quickly from half back, and we pushed our forwards up high. We moved the ball quickly from half back, and we were able to get it over the back. Whereas yeah. now we we we're treacle slow, so and which is all well and good if you've got players that are are willing to work hard, run into space, and present when the ball's going in forward. At the moment, we don't have blokes who are willing to run to space. We don't have blokes who are willing to impose themselves up forward and, uh, you know, present to take a mark. When was the last time you saw Josh Jenkins put on a hard lead? In fact, there was one, I think it was in the last quarter, where um, uh, the ball came came into Jenkins and um, it was intercepted by the North Melbourne bloke. Now, if Josh, I reckon it was with about five minutes to go, if Josh Jenkins was on a hard lead, he would have taken that bloke out. But he actually yeah. physically gave up because the guy cut it in front of him. Physically gave up. You could see him take the foot off the accelerator. Now, any fo- any forward, Mac, any forward, a Jason Dunster or a Tony Lockett, uh, a Buddy Franklin, any forward, if, if he's on a lead and some bloke comes in to intercept him, those blokes are going to make sure that bloke doesn't intercept him again. But yeah, jo- but Josh definitely. just Josh actually slowed down and put his hands up in the air, his palms up, as if to say, "Oh well, you got me there." What? We we're playing a, a physical contact sport, for goodness' sake. Yeah, look, I, I can't disagree with you. That the, I think there there has to be uh, some personnel changes uh, to the team, and I think the coaches have to take a good look at themselves and come up with a structure that will work with the players that we've got. Because at the moment, there's nothing in sync, is there? No. And g'day to Nikki, who's joined us. Uh, how you going, Nick? <laughs> I just came in on the that particular, where you were talking about the, the JJ moment. I was so rokeable. Oh, he was Jesus. close enough to contest that ball. Yes, he was. Absolutely close enough. If it he'd was... accelerated, he would have taken the bloke out, Nick. He, he looks so disinterested. It, no, he yeah. looks soft. Sadly, he does. He, sadly, he does, Nicky. Yeah. So, and, and that kind of pissed me off because we had Tex actually looking like he was trying to be more proactive and was getting up the ground a bit more, did some good stuff. You saw at the start that Eddie really had, the, you know, we've got this, we've got this, we've got to do this. And then there's JJ, who's really that main focal point in the forward line, just going, no, I didn't make it. Oh, okay. Yeah. What about that miss with the, uh, when he's about a metre out from goal and, and all he had to do was really just concentrate and uh, take a couple of steps out and uh, kick the ball around the corner for the, with his left foot for a goal, whereas he rushes it, plays on and kick, kicks the bloody thing nowhere I, at my, a crucial stage. Well, I, I've had an additional thought about JJ because you know I've never really been a fan um, and I've always put his... Um, his effort and work rate down to laziness and softness. But I actually think he's arrogant. I actually think that he thinks he's better than what he is. Because I'll go along with that. Because I'll go along with that. He, his, his goal-kicking technique is loose. His concentration is poor. He spits the dummy when the ball doesn't come in the way he likes it and he's not prepared to work around 50-50 contests. And I reckon that's just arrogance. It's it's smacks of somebody that that feels like it's everyone else's fault instead of Josh's fault. That's that's how I view him at the moment. Well, he has I, to be dropped. Yeah, and I, I would trade him at the end of the year. I'm seriously because 
I think young Fogarty, we, we recruited a young bloke in, in Fogarty at the draft pick 12, who was regarded as if he had didn't have the injury, would have been right up in the top three or four or in that particular year. And we've gone about not using him very well at all or developing very well, well at all, in my opinion. In most sides, he would have been playing games up forward consistently and getting himself uh, more and more up to the pace of that particular level. And I still think um, he at full forward would be a better bet for us than Jenkins. I just, I just, even though the kid's not even properly ready for it, but at least uh, I'd play him there. I'd bring in Himmelberg. Oh yeah, Him Himmelberg played well. Uh, Himmelberg in the had twos. a fantastic NFL game. Oh, did he? Is he? Because yep. the, the problem he was like, leading. He was leading at the ball carrier beautifully. His leading patterns were really good as well, keeping it more in the center. Um, he had beautiful, beautiful service to him. We were actually passing to his advantage. And I'm sitting there at that SNFL game. I had really high hopes for the AFL game because there's often a correlation between how the SNFL team plays and how the AFL team plays. And it was so obvious that we'd worked on our forwards leading patterns, that we'd worked on actually kicking into our forwards better. And then that got dished up in the second half on the Sunday night. And I was just like, "Mm mm-hmm, great. Who didn't pay attention to coaching this week? Uh, JJ. Well, well, uh, Nick, uh, it's a point that I was going to raise a little bit later, but you've raised it now, so I'll, I'll run with it. If we don't, Don Pike came out in his presser and say, didn't, said, said, and people have misquoted him, he didn't say he wasn't going to make wholesale changes. He said he wanted to talk to the players before he considered changes. But if wholesale changes aren't made, it's an admission by the coaches that the players aren't following game plan. So if he backs yeah. in essentially the same 22 next week, you know, with one or two changes perhaps, then what he's basically saying is that these players are good enough but they're not following the system. So, and I I would wholeheartedly disagree with that at the moment. I I don't care what the system is. There's players out there that just aren't doing the the little one percenters. Uh, We've talked about JJ. Matt Crouch is another one. Matt Crouch couldn't get involved at all during the game on the weekend. Yeah, I was not happy with his game. I haven't been happy with his game the past couple of weeks. He, he He doesn't look fit. Uh, he was chasing, I reckon it was chasing Goldstein at one stage and he couldn't even catch him. Like he had yeah, 20. I remember he was, he was struggling like he was chasing somebody and uh, losing ground on it. I, I, I think to some degree he's, he's falling into the trap of um, a little bit of the Rockcliffe stuff, you know, let's just get some of the, some of the stats going and just uh, little little chips here and little chips there and, um, really gaining nowhere while they, they set up a little bit further up, uh, back. And yet we know he can be proactive. But the thing of it is, yeah. the, th- the thing of it is, like he's had 29 touches at 55% disposal efficiency. He's had 12 contested and 16 uncontested. So the numbers themselves, you'd think, oh, not a bad game. But a simple eye test will tell you the it's not only the balls that he got, but it was what he did when he didn't have the ball. And I didn't see him get on the end of any pass, handball or foot pass, during transition. He doesn't run. And what is it about our club that turns decent young athletes into blokes who look like they're 100 years old? <laughs> he, he looks like he can't run, Matt Crouch. Well, he's never been a top runner, though. No, no, That's no, always been a knock on him. Never been he's a top runner, fast. Nick. Never been a top runner, Nick. But he's in a professional athletic organisation. Well, he, he, should, should he, he should be fit. He should be loose. He should be flexible. He should be able to cover the ground. He doesn't look like he can bloody walk without, without limping at the moment. It, and if he's injured, we've got blokes in the twos. We've got inside players who can play an inside role. We, we could have given Matty Crouch a rest if he was injured and played Cameron Ellis Yolman or brought in Hugh Greenwood or played Miles in the middle. You know, we've got inside players, plenty of them. So why, if Matt Crouch isn't injured, then what the hell is going on? Because he can hardly walk, let alone run. Yeah, and, and I thought he was over his injuries because we know he was carrying um, quite a few last year and he was quite banged up and we and we had to 
well, we didn't have to, but we did carry him through the season. And from what I understood, he got freshened up a lot. Um, and the same with all of our midfield. Um, I do think, have you actually discussed the the Chase Jones concussion? Not yet. Not yet. Because that was, to me, was the absolute turning point. Because as soon as that happened, it meant we lost, we had to put one of our midfielders up forward. So we started the third quarter with Brad in the forward line. And he actually did quite nicely there. But it meant our midfielders were spending more time on the ground than what they normally would. And we took Ellis Yolman off Cunnington. And as soon as that happened, they got their run on. And I'm just screaming in the second half, put him fucking back on Cunnington. Yeah, because we weren't getting the ball down there enough. I wouldn't have made that move that they made at all. I would have left it as it was, Nicky. And uh, Rory Sloan and uh, Brad Crouch, uh, and I made this comment before you came on air, they were resting up forward and were out of the play for big hunks of the time. Yeah. These these are your best players. They're your best players. We, we, you know, uh, Riley Knight, he could be the guy out there that does all the checking. Yeah, not your, ab- best, not your best players. A- absolutely, Riley Knight. Um, he could have been. We could have pushed. I mean, Rory Atkins got a bit of it in the first half, but again, he was a turnover merchant and he faded as the game went on. Um, there were options, and I, and I'm with you. I, I think if they've come in with a plan, which is to blanket Cunnington with Ellis Yolman, and he was doing a good job of it in the first half. Mm-hmm. What? Why do you move away from that plan? That's your plan. That's your game plan. So you get an injury, you don't throw all your plans out. Do you know we only had sixty-seven of ninety uh, rotations? We only had sixty-seven rotations for the match. Yeah, we should have been using that more. You know, we we leave a bloke like D Mac on for bloody. Oh, how long was D Mac on the ground for? Uh, I can't even see it. Now, 85% of the time. Brody Smith was on for 90% of the time. But Brad Crouch only had 65% game time. Oh, God, I don't get it. I just don't and if, get he's, it. If, he's, if, he's, if he's fully fit, then that shouldn't be the case. You know, so what's going on? Oh, what? mind you, I do wonder, though, he was off for a long time getting his broken nose seen to. Yeah. So yeah, that, probably might, about... that might affect his numbers a little bit. Yeah, you're right, but... 65% time on ground. That's just over half a game, Nick. It's not even three quarters. Yeah. That's longer than that broken nose took. It is, although that, that was most of the, the the quarter. But still, you, you're right. That doesn't account for the time what should have been on most, most of the ground in the last quarter. Our, our time on ground stats are actually quite staggering because – we usually have a handful of players, usually defenders, up into the 90s. Our mids mm. are usually sort of 75 to 80. Yep. But, but I would say the majority, of our, the majority of our team are in the 80s. In fact, there's only Brad Crouch, Ellis Yeoman, Riley Knight and uh, obviously Chase Jones. They're the only four players that are on the ground for less than 80% of the game. Now, that's pretty high by our standards. And considering we only had 67% or oh, 67 rotations or whatever it was, 69 for the game, what the hell is going on with that? And surely in a game where your midfielders are playing a taxing game of football, surely they're the ones that you're rotating. You should be flicking them on and off and uh, trying to save them as much as possible. But we had Matty Crouch on for 86% of the game. No wonder he couldn't run. He can't run anyway, but he was probably cooked. Yeah. And teams are isolating him really well because they know he is the absolute liability and he will not defensively run. Now, the fact that Greenwood's got to work on his defensive running and yet Matt Crouch is in the team, I'm, hmm, somebody's got a golden ticket. Is that why Greenwood's not in the team? Well, yeah, Green- that's what he said. Greenwood, it's, it's, yeah. It's, he, he actually did say that it's um, his defensive running GPS numbers. He just has to improve those. And he very much did that in the Santa Fe game. Well, I'd rather see him in the side and have 100% attacking time with the ball in our forward lines all the time rather than uh, chasing it down the back lines. But Greenwood would have been in my side two weeks ago. 
But at least playing forward, like you said, Mac, the, guy, the yep. kid can take a mark and, and kick a goal. Um, so you have him in the team. You know, yeah, uh, anyway. Well, yeah, I, I, I just don't get our structures at the moment where we've got players that I believe that should be in the side and we've got absolutely non-performance at the moment in some of our players. That that was... I, I, I'll just put it to Nicky. Nicky, tell me three good things about it, the game. Forward line, midfield, back line, anyone? Uh, the first half, Eddie, was... No, we're talking really about the whole game. About, being... about the whole game. Well, he didn't have a lot of opportunities in the second half, but he was still trying and really trying to create. Um, so he did quite well there. Um, midfield, I liked about how proactive Rob is once the ball is on the ground, but that's something I've always liked from him. I thought he was very dudded by the umpiring. Um Back lines. Keith. Apart from Keith. Um, Keith, I have a problem with. Jesus, I had a lot of other problems apart from him. Yeah, no, the one problem was we got the ball in his hands a lot of the time and he had a case of the Kellys. He was incredibly slow to move it on. Um, there were opportunities for him to do so and he still took his time, whereas Kelly was being a lot quicker and was making very quick decisions, which is something we've and a lot of people have had a go at him about that. So whilst Keith's defensive efforts um, and everything else were really good, he still took too long, which enabled North to set up and stop our transition out of defence, which should have been a lot more proactive. But is that Keith's uh, fault or is that our lack of <laughs> our lack of run I'm and not spread? Actually, I, I think it uh, it was a bit of both. Nah. Um, because there were times nah. there were time there were times when no, because they were showing a lot of longer shots, mm -hmm. and there were times when yet yeah, there wasn't a lot of options for him. But there were other times when there were that pass, and he still there was that hesitation. I would say, Nicky, without fear of contradiction, that. About eighty percent of the time, he had no options. And just because a player's uh, looks free from that down the ground shot, doesn't mean it's it a is good option. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's a good option because they they play a zone. Uh, the the defenders play a zone, and uh, as soon as they see a ball, like once you once you start kicking more than twenty five meters, you the danger is that the ball hangs in the air and and, and the zone can chop it off. So. Yeah, it's got to be the lower pass, which he can do. He I, I, can do yeah, quite the, nicely, but he is, he is a bit restricted in being a lefty. The the point is, and, though, the point and is, we though, have to Nick, set up for that. But but the thing of it is, those down the ground shots provided very uh, very large evidence that our mids weren't running. No, mm. they weren't. It they was that, weren't it was that running at all in that second half. That was just shocking. They but, were entirely to blame. Oh, and I know it a good thing in the midfield is actually I thought Cam had a good game for the role that he was given and the run he was trying to create. I thought his hands were good. I actually quite liked him. I thought his yeah, hands were good. I quite liked him being in the team. And I thought he did a good defensive job. But, I mean, the balance in that midfield is all wrong. Uh, let's, let's look at some individual stats just quickly um, yeah. because we got Lady on 31 touches. Now... Had no influence on the game, in my opinion. Not not one scrap of influence on the game. Uh, Matty Crouch, 29 touches. Brad Crouch, 24 touches. Brad played all right in patches, but he only had seven kicks, Braddy Crouch. And again, in, in, a, in a game where we were kicking the ball, for Brad Crouch to only have seven kicks, something's not right there. Uh, Rory Atkins, uh, 21 disposals. I felt like he was trying to run and carry in the first half, but as is normally the case with Rat, as soon as the uh, the wick got turned up, he went missing. Tommy Lynch, again... And he's, a, he's an outside player. He actually has to rely on those inside players getting the ball, and they're not getting the ball. Yeah, but I think he, I actually think that what Atkins does when the heat goes on, he runs to um, to play. He still runs, because you can tell that by his, by his GPS stats, but he runs to um, places that aren't legitimate target areas. 
<laughs> I think he just I think he honestly just runs up and down, but he doesn't actually put himself into the play. He try he, he's, he's not proactive. He, no, he, no, 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 he's not even proactive. He's he's a squib. Because he doesn't yeah, I think you're you're suggesting he runs to places where he knows the ball won't come. Well, yeah, they're unrealistic areas, Macca. He doesn't put himself in the middle of the play. He doesn't put himself on the path between the bloke with the ball and the goals, right? The direct the sad thing it's hard to argue with you on that point. He, he never does. He and so like it's all right when we when we've got a bit of run and spread and he can be the outrider and and get the handball receive and kick it down, but when he's actually got to present in a tight contest, he's nowhere to be found because he's still waiting for the ball on the outside because that's the easy option. Uh, yeah. Tommy Tommy Lynch, I, I felt eh, uh, probably suffered from a, a, a lack of uh, decent ball. Uh, if you're trying to be that conduit, I don't think you can have much of a influence on the game if the ball's stagnating at half back. Keith, didn't I thought played well. No, no, Keith, I thought played well. Brody Smith uh, has had a disappointing start to the season after a very encouraging last couple of games last year. He doesn't look as he, I hate to say this, he looks like he's playing scared, Brody Smith. Yep. He doesn't want to take that long kick. Well, yeah, what is, what's, what is the story about that? I was complaining about that before you came on, Nikki. Yeah, I've got no idea. No idea because we actually saw him take a couple of them in the JLT. So what's happened between JLT and now? I don't know. He had 13 kicks, seven rebound 50s, but only had 420 metres gain, which is about two, 200 shy on his usual output. Um, and I, the reason I raise this is because I've got a point to make after after we go through this. Miller had 12 kicks, um, a couple of rebound 50s, uh, only one contested well, possession. In yep, went into the midfield. Uh, didn't I oh, got one clearance. Uh, so didn't have a huge impact in the midfield. Um, DMAC had a DMAC game, 17 touches, did a little bit of everything and nothing really hurt the opposition oh, to any no, great he extent. Did, he did in the first half. Well, he wasn't He wasn't terrible, he, Nick, he, but he was, it was a standard David no, McKay he, game. No, he was, he was creating those night. He was actually creating good forward 50 entries and providing run and carry. Did you see the oh, locations that he was putting into I tend to half agree with Nicky on this one because of the fact that there were a couple of good dashes that he did where he got the ball in quickly into the forward line, which does give the forwards a chance. Mm. And they, that, that was pretty rare. We didn't get anything out of it, but mm. he did give a chance. Yeah, where was he kicking them to? You go, you go back and have a well, look. Well, look... <laughs> I'm not, not interested so... in re-watching this. No. no I'm, I was I'm saying before, Nick, I, I was so pissed off with the game I didn't even cut up any video highlights this week. Um, Good. No Please one, don't do that to us. No one has talked about this, but Rory Sloan had eight and eight for sixteen. He had seven tackles, which we come to expect from Sloaney, but he had sixteen disposals, uh, seven contested possessions, uh, only one hundred and sixty-one meters gained. Um, well, as a person who had Sloaney in his dream team and watched him very closely, I was spewing because of the amount of time he spent standing up forward with the ball and the forward lines when the ball is down the other end. And he was there for bloody ages. And I'm thinking to myself, this is one of the, this is one bloke who is a warrior and will get in there and fight. And you've got him in a bloody forward pocket or a half forward bank hanging around doing nothing. 85, just... 85% time on ground, Sloaney, for, yeah, six, for 16 touches. The forward line, doing nothing. That's not good enough. But he wasn't near the ball for half that time. He's he only near the ball for about 40-something percent of the time. Oh, it was absolutely ridiculous. Uh, the way they used well, him. Yeah, it was absolutely ridiculous. I, I don't know whose brilliant coaching move this was, but it was bloody stupid. As you said before, Fiend, if they left it, it wasn't just uh, use the, the lesser players' destruction, not, you, not your stars. Mm -hmm. It's bloody stupid. Yep. Uh, look, Riley O'Brien, uh, I thought, improved, but got towed up by a dinosaur in Todd Goldstein. Um, and if Riley O'Brien still a bloody clever ruckman, of course he's a bloody clever ruckman. But yeah. he got, but and, he still got monstered by half, a dinosaur. I thought Rob, I thought Rob was actually holding his own very nicely in that first half, but then that that second half just yeah. And 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 the other thing was that 
even when JJ went in there, like we've commented, um, it was two weeks ago, that JJ was having a poor game up forward. But once he was in the ruck, he was actually contesting more. He didn't provide good enough um, uh, contests uh, in the yeah, ruck as well. Point, Nikki. I was going to make the same comment that, uh, to Fiend because Fiend was talking about rucking in full time. Well, uh, on what he did on the weekend uh, when he was in the ruck, I'd be just sacking him, not, not rucking him. Oh, well, him. I mean, it, it's... We, we were talking about how how best to use Jenkins based on I Jenkins that. based on Jenkins no, actually being no 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 yeah I know but I, I, I would have to take him yeah yeah but look Riley O'Brien um, not a bad second up game but I, look I'm not seeing it for Riley I, I'm, I'm not seeing, seeing it. it he had 14 hitouts with 84 percent time on ground uh, Toddy Goldstein had pretty good numbers uh, had uh, 22 disposals 24 hitouts. Um, you know, it was, you know, relatively influential for them. Ten score involvements for Toddy Goldstein. Um, I think he kicked one, kicked one. Oh, no, two points he kicked. But, uh, yeah, uh, Riley O'Brien's a young lad playing for his AFL career. Uh, Todd Goldstein is a workhorse ex-champion who's clearly at the back end of his career. Um, and Riley didn't take his opportunity, unfortunately. Well, what I want to say about Riley O'Brien, um, I thought he, he, he did get beaten and he, and he got towed up and he gave away some frees, et cetera. Um, but it's not his fault in the sense that he's only got a certain amount of ability. We, we, we have not stocked up correctly in terms of having reserve ruckman and this is what we've got. And the one thing I'll say about Riley O'Brien, yeah, he stuffed up a lot and he gave away frees and he got beaten on the night and all that. But he never ever stopped trying. Oh, he's, if, he's a tryer, no doubt about that. It's not a knock on players, Riley O'Brien. The other players who had much more ability than him tried as hard as he did on the night. We wouldn't have got beaten. Yep. Because the one thing I Quite do off. say, Benny, his, his effort was outstanding. The output wasn't outstanding, but the yep. effort was. I agree a hundred percent on that. Hundred uh, percent. He, he the, never, never would I suggest that Riley wasn't trying or, or wasn't trying to get involved. Um, I just think he's a bit limited in today's game. Yep, I agree and with that. I, I don't think he gives us... He, I don't think he's capable of giving us enough to warrant being the next man up in terms of uh, the, the ruck stocks. Yeah, uh, I agree with that too. And, I, you know, yep. they're talking about Saws coming back next week. I would have loved to have seen them give Paul Hunter a go. No matter what some people said in the um, the... Big footy yes, NFL thread, and they thought Hunter was atrocious and bad. Being at the game, he was comprehensively beating Redden, and he was doing it very smartly. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think bringing him in against, if you're not going to bring in Himmelberg for JJ, which is what they should do, um, and Himmelberg can ruck. We can put him in the ruck and he can play the JJ role. That is what he plays in the twos. He needs to play it in the first. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about him, he's only played the one game, hasn't he? Yeah. Um, then in that one game that he did, what we saw was a guy that was bursting his poop of our trying to get the ball and and uh, quite physical about the whole thing too. So um, that's something that Jenkins is. He attempts. Take contested marks, and often he actually does take them. So he's a genuine he's forward, he's Nicky. Taller, and he's taller than Jacobs. Yeah, yeah I liked him actually. Yeah. I, I, Gen- I, I, genuine forward. I I love easy. Yeah, look, um, um, which the play, which the players do call him that. Yeah, look, uh, Riley Knight. I think I've just about seen enough of Riley Knight. I don't think he. It, we've been. I've been saying now for I reckon twelve months. Macca doesn't get enough of the ball, and True. Riley Knight still doesn't get enough of the ball. If if we have average DMAT gains, we also have rolling night average gains, and that's eight and seven for fifteen. A few tackles, um, a couple of nice you know defensive efforts, but you know five contested possessions, sixty six percent disposal efficiency, one hundred and twenty nine meters gained, not good enough. Not Coach good enough. Coach loves him. Yeah. Coach loves him. Uh, yeah, Jake Kelly. I, I, yeah, I, I didn't share Nicky's enthusiasm for no, Jake. No, I, I didn't either. I, I thought the one thing you, you, will, you can always say about Jake, he is trying his hardest. 
Yeah, well, that's I think the he... same thing you said. You said about Rob. You you know that's what he's going to get. But no, for me, what I the point I was making with Kelly is the one thing we had a go at him was that he slows us down. He didn't this game. Well, I saw him slow. I saw him slow it down he at was... least half a dozen times, Nick. And I saw him a few times when we were trying yeah. to transition the ball between half back and half forward. He was pointing backwards to, to kick the ball back when we're trying to move the ball forward. No, he's, I can remember he's, that. He's pointing backwards. He is not proactive. He is not aggressive. And I know that not everyone can be that way with their disposal. But we've got too many of those types. So who do you want in the team and who, who can you afford to drop to get someone that's a bit more aggressive in their ball movement? We've got a, a young lad who got drafted, a uh, uh, young Shoal, who's had two high possession gains off halfback. Oh, God, he's good. We just need to give him a run. I was going to raise Jake you, Kelly I mean, is not going to get any better. What we see from Jake Kelly right now is what we're always going to get from Jake Kelly. The, yeah, the problem though is Kelly actually has that stronger body, which Shoal oh. does not. And to me, that if Shoal's coming in, it's for Smith or Miller. No, it's no, those no, no, no. type of roles in well, terms who's of the Jake, balance. Who's Jake? And the size of, but no, no, this is what they will put it on. As, no. And this is how I, I'm guessing, very strongly that that's how the club, the coaches will look at it because it's that balance of who you're mixing up against. And the, but they haven't the got the balance right place. at the moment. No, they don't. So but like we're I playing. Do think he's got to come in. We're we're playing Talia, Hardigan, and Keith, and you're saying Jake Kelly is in because he's a stronger body as well. So we've got no, four. No, that's how they will. Yeah, no, 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 but that's, see yeah. That so, yeah, so that's fine. The last two weeks we've been playing against forward lines that have one key forward. Mm. Geelong had one key forward. North Melbourne had one key forward. They played Mason Wood very high, and he's, he's only just a key forward, and he, they, he certainly didn't play that way. So Ben Brown. So all of a sudden, we look top heavy, and you could see it on, on paper. That for the last two yeah. weeks, we have looked top heavy. So if you want to have Alex Keith do the Tom Today role, if you want to have two tools, Hardigan and, and Talia, then you don't need Jake Kelly in the team because we're too slow and we're too non-proactive down back. You know, we rely on, on Smithers and Lairdy and Miller and McKay when they're playing back there Push. to move it's the ball. It's very simple. If they push Laird back into Kelly's role on the full back line and put Shoal on that flank. Yeah, yeah. I've got no problem if they do that, Nicky. But the point is I will because bring him into boy, the Because, boy, that kid can run. Well, I've been hearing very good reports from people who have been to the game and they reckon he should be in the team. Yep, and we won't see it because we know what this club is like. So, anyway, that's the defence. In terms of the forward line, we just need it. We just need some genuine forwards. And Josh Jenkins is not a genuine forward. I don't give a shit if he's second ruck. He's just not a genuine forward. And at the moment, he's playing with the passion of a dead turtle. So he <laughs> does. He doesn't deserve to be in the team. We've got a. We've got blokes in the twos that are playing well. Ben Davis and Elliot Himmelberg both playing very well in the twos. We've got Darcy Fogarty, who was a standout forward in his draft year. We've got those three blokes, and I know Darcy's been struggling down back, but he's actually a... played well. Played but... well down back this week. I'll give him that. Do... He shouldn't be there. Yet. But do you, do you know what? You just put him in the team. Just put. It... He's a first twenty-two player. Just put him in the team. Yeah. Elliot, Elliot Himmelberg needs to come in. Ben Davis needs to come in. Tyson Stengel needs to come in. Lockie Murphy. I've got a lot of time for Lockie Murphy, but we're not getting enough out of him. Uh, we only got 10 disposals. We didn't get any defensive pressure from him whatsoever. Uh, only six contested possessions. He, only five score involvements from, from someone who's playing half forward. It's not enough. Um, Chase Jones uh, is obviously going to have to come out. I would like to see Tyson Stengel come in either for Chase or for Lockie Murphy. Um, I think we need to have some X factor up forward and I need. I, I think we need to just end the careers of a couple of players who are not going to get any better. 
It's hard, hard to argue with that. And well, we have I think to. We have to. We have to make. And would you bring Gibbs back in? Well, not on, not on form. No, not on the performance he had. I don't, I don't know how he, he played. Got, he got better. He got better as the game went on. Um, he was a, yeah, it was a lot better in the second half, but he wasn't very good in the first half. Cam, Cam and I have been told that the decision to drop Bryce was a mutual one. What, you mean between him and the club or? Bryce asked to be dropped. That he knew he wasn't performing the standard he should be. Yep. Okay. And you know what? And, and if that's the case, then absolute kudos is to him. Yeah. But look, I mean, I know that we're not going to see 37 changes, but out of the current team, we've got at least two midfielders that need to come out. Matt Crouch and Rory Atkins, I believe, need to come out. In defence... You can put Shoal on the wing. Yeah, in defence, you've got David... I know David plays on the wing, but I'd see him as a halfback. You've got D-Mac. Yeah, he does both. Yeah. D-Mac, you've got uh, Jake Kelly, I think, need to come out. Through the mids... Also, uh, Riley Knight needs to come out um, and up forward. I don't think he's play- he hasn't really played any. Mi- he didn't play midfield at all. In the he was North up game, on he was up think. on the wing. He was up on the wing for. So large that was parts the high, that was the high ha- that was the high half forward role. Yeah, he well, didn't actually go into the midfield rotation at all. No, he didn't go into midfield rotation, but he was playing high up. Um, up forward, Jenkins. Uh, we're obviously not going to drop bets for his three hundredth, but. Probably Lockie Murphy has to come out. And also I think we have to think about Kyle Hardigan because Kyle Hardigan has been atrocious, absolutely well, atrocious. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to raise the point about Hardigan. I, I, I actually like Hardo. I know he's not as the, the highest quality defender as you can possibly have, but I think um, he's got a very unique little skill set which works when he's playing well. But he is very much a, a bit of a confidence player um, because, and often those type of players who don't have that high skill level, that that's what happens to them. Um, I, I, I think yeah, Hardigan I, plays all right when he plays instinctively, but the minute yeah. he has to think, he, he as witness again when he did try to do that short pass crossing to the centre of the ground or at the centre of the forward line and gave away a goal. I mean, just classic Hardigan when he has to think. Instinctively, he's okay, uh, but once he's got to think, uh, no, he's no good. I, I, I'd play him if we're short, but if, if we've got other players, I, I, I'd play them. Well, I think the thing too that you're probably missing with Hardigan, because I mean, I, I've I've liked Hardigan in the team um, up until recently, but I think Hardigan plays well when the defence is playing well. Uh, yeah. and when when his role then can be very clearly defined and it can be very uh, not a small role when, but n- yeah, not much to think about. Job. Kyle, yeah. go go yes. there and stand on that guy and don't let him kick a goal. That's Kyle yeah. Hardigan like, can like do he, that. Like yeah, Kyle Hardigan right. can do that, but he can't. He's he's not to be relied on when the other the other players in the defensive half are struggling. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the problem at the moment with Hearts is that because uh, blokes around him are struggling um, and because we haven't got Dude and and et cetera, et cetera, um, he's been put into more positions where he's had, had to think outside of his own role and I don't think that's working very well for him at the moment. And four kicks, I, I know he's playing a defensive role, but four kicks, no contested possessions, 50% disposal um, efficiency and 50 metres gain for the game. Oh, we just can't, you one. just can't carry those numbers. You just can't. No, no, you can't. And uh, I think, um, unfortunately, I thought Talia had only an average game by his standard. Yeah, I did too. If you look at who, who'd be the comparable in North for for Hardigan, would it be Scott Thompson? You reckon? Yeah, well, he's, a, he's a, supposed to be the equivalent. Yeah, so he had, Scott Scott Thompson had seventeen possessions and nine nine marks. Um, and uh, 273 metres gained. Um, See, Thompson 88%. plays higher, though. Uh, he plays centre-half. He plays centre-back. He was on Walker. Yeah, well, so Hardigan, who was Hardigan, who was Hardigan playing Hardigan on? Hardigan, who's on the back line. Who was Hardigan playing on? 
whoever was in the back, whoever was their forward pocket, pretty much. Uh, so yeah, forward pocket yeah, who runs? Pocket. He wasn't on Ben no, Brown because Tully was no, on Barrett he was Brown. On ben Brown, and he was, he was sometimes on Mason Woods, and he was sometimes not on Mason Wood. No, Mason um, Wood, I think it was the guy who was he was getting beaten by it. Yeah, Mason well, Wood was playing Keith, high. We're just talking about it. Yeah, no, that was Keith was taking him. Come on, Nikki. When he was when he Come was on. up more high. No, on, but Nikki. no, I'm actually backing up your point you made that the fact that he didn't have one set opponent, he had a multitude of different ones, and yeah. as you pointed out so well, he can't cope with that because it's he's got to think. It's a bit beyond him, and I don't mean <laughs> that. I don't. No, no, no. I don't mean that yeah. as an insult. To his intellect, I, I'm just saying. Just in terms fact. of his, in no, terms of his ability as a player, I, I don't think yeah. he's a proactive footballer, and I think he's very and, task oriented. And that's actually a disservice that's being done to him by the coaches. Yeah. So, well, well, it's only a disservice because they're playing him when there really isn't a matchup. Because for the last two weeks, there hasn't been a matchup for Kyle Hart. There hasn't so, been, so he shouldn't have been in the team. Exactly mm. right. Exactly right. And. So, I mean, we've gone through stats, we've gone through the rant and all the rest of it, but the last thing that we need to talk about is selection and coaching because I can't work it out. Uh, and I think we've we've gone on long enough with this group, in my opinion, and the players, the age profile of this group in terms of the seniors is such that what you see from the seniors is what you're going to get. I don't, I don't think you could look at a Tex Walker or, or a Crouch Brother or a Tom Lynch, or a Josh Jenkins, or a David McKay, or a Rory Sloan, and expect that one day you're going to see something different to what you've seen so far. Would that be correct? Yeah, I think it's fair. Yeah. There's no more improvement on... Maybe in the Crouch Boys, Brad, possibly, because he's They are are actually young enough, those guys. Yeah, they are, but, but they've also played, you know... Reasonable amount of game. I think, I think with, Brad, with uh, Brad, and, Brad and Matt, there's there's some chance there. Uh, yeah. They're young enough too. I, I guess what I'm getting at is though that if if you've seen that from your from your senior players, um, you know, and look, Tex looked a bit up and about, and he looks great when. And how was that left foot pass? That was just unbelievable. That was magnificent. Unbelievable. Yeah. But you know, he only got it eleven times. He only took three marks. Um, you know, he uh, didn't kick. A, uh, what did he kick? Goal, one goal. So, when was the last time Tex Walker kicked multiple goals? I think it's like thirteen games ago that Tex Walker kicked multiple goals. So, what I'm saying is that we've we've seen what we're going to see uh, from those blokes. We've got young blokes in the twos. We're obviously not cutting the mustard at the moment. The system isn't working. Is our club going to be bold enough to call time on a few careers because it's time now? It looks like the premiership window is very, very nearly shut. It's time now to rejuvenate this list and they've got to actually end some careers, in my opinion. Well, if you actually, though, if you look at the recent premiers, they're a mix of those young players and the experience. That's right. And we're not quite doing that. We've got it a little bit, but we need more of those younger players coming in. And we've identified a couple of them already. The, the only problem is that one of them that we actually consider a young player in Greenwood, he's actually a lot older. 26, but yeah. He's young, yeah, but he's young in terms of AFL football. Mm. Well, the other problem, um, the, the other problem, sorry to cut you off, Nick, but the other problem we have when we do bring new blokes in, we don't play them in position. Like you, you look at a Collingwood or, or a team like that that's been successful over the last few years, they actually put faith in their young kids. Yeah. Uh, like Jaden Stevenson, for example. They, they He's always going to play that position. That's Is right. he ever going to play midfield? No. Nope. He's that's going to be that elusive half forward forward pocket. And to my mind, our club gets gets a player in. Let, let's uh, And I don't want to pick on a player, but let's let's look at Miles Baholke, right? They draft, and yeah. I, I had high hopes for Miles, so they draft Miles as a tough inside midfielder who can take a mark and hit the, hit the scoreboard, right? And uh, he's struggled to get to the level, but over the last few games in at SNFL level, he's been doing exactly that. He's been a tough inside midfielder that can get forward and kick a goal. Yeah. So when we put him into the A's, 
why aren't we playing him as a tough inside midfielder that can go forward and kick a goal? Because that's <laughs> that's what he yeah. fucking is. Mm-hmm. That's what he is. That actually does go to the game because it was a tail of two halves because he was actually playing inside in the midfield in the first half. I don't so, know where he was in the second quarter. Well, we the were discussing what his, what his role him. was well, because we couldn't work it out. I think that put him in forward a bit. It's all because he has he he's like his early AFL games that he the couple that he did play he did play up forward. I think that's what we 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 did that with him. So it's the same with Jordan Gallucci. When Jordan Gallucci came in, where, where we play him forward pocket half forward. The guy is a midfielder, so you back the guy in. You pick him because you you draft him because of his qualities. And yes, they're light and all the rest of it. But you draft him because of certain qualities. You Pace. play you play him there, play him there. You don't you don't draft a, a ruckman and then play him in a forward pocket for God's sakes. So why would you draft a midfielder and play him in the forward pocket? And it seems to me that our squad at the moment is full of failed midfielders. We got David McKay is a fa- failed midfielder. Riley Knight is a failed midfielder. Miles Baholke is not cutting it as a failed midfielder. We've got a Lockie Murphy is is being played up forward because he can't play in the midfield. We've got too many players at the moment that are playing out of position because they want them to be in the side, but they're not actually playing in the position where they were drafted or where they where their talent lies. And it's a real problem for us for our list profile, in my opinion, that we have too many blokes that are being asked to do roles and, and Fogarty B one um, playing down back, um, mm. being asked to do roles because they're trying to shoehorn them in. It's like they draft guys on talent and then go, all right, well, what are we going to do with this bloke? Uh, well, we haven't well, got enough we... room up forward, so we'll play him down back. I've, I've actually just said it in the, the comments in the chat. The, the problem for Fog is that we have too many key forwards So what are we drafting? On our list. Nikki, I, I remember what you well, said. Well, we did it... because we, we – yeah, because we, we need that. And for me, he's the one who can go down and play back. He is that player we know. But hang on, you've been t- you've strong. been telling me that he's been getting towed up down back. So which is he it? He has been when he's been on those big SNFL forwards who are as strong as he is. Ah, so what you're saying is he could play today's role, which is what I've been saying for a month, Nick. Well, because I hadn't Touché. seen it because they hadn't played him like that in the back lines. They had put him. So we finally brought in one of our top up players who is actually a very strong fullback. So Fogg was not playing the full back role. He was playing against a player who was slightly smaller than him and he can actually outbody and he showed all the tricks and things that he can do. Perfect. But as a forward, part of my comment in the chat was, is he actually going to develop in the SANFL playing in a forward role? Whereas Himmelberg needs to do that. Straw needs to do that. They're um, different types of players. Is- Nikki, yeah, make a but comment. the key forwards. Otherwise, we've got three key forwards, and it just we saw that when we had Deer on the list. So we had Deer Himmelberg um, and Davis as well, because he plays as that that he plays the more Lynch role, but he's more a key forward than what Lynch is in terms Nikki, of who's the a better footballer out of Fog and Strawn? Oh, Fog. So what were you? So what you're saying is. Uh, we draft number 12 as a forward and because we've got somebody who's a lesser player up forward, he needs to develop. We, put, we take the bloke who should be being groomed up forward to go into the AFL and put him in the back line. That's just insanity. What you're basically... What, what it's akin to is playing Tex Walker in the twos down back because yeah. Darcy it's Fogarty is... is is Tex Walker reincarnated, basically. He's got the same Correct. game style. He's got the same attributes. He's almost got the same bloody haircut, right? So <laughs> could you have imagined the uproar if Neil Craig, when he dropped Tex back in the early part of his career, whether Craigie then put another hammer in, the, uh, nail in the coffin and said, oh, by the way, you're going to play at full back. Craigie wouldn't, have, Craigie wouldn't have been able to get out of the stadium. So... This is my problem with the list at the moment is that I think we've got too many almost players and we're trying to shoehorn too many almost players into positions because, oh, yeah, but they've got talent. Well, there's a lot of talented players that didn't make it in the position that they play 
who miss out on AFL lists or who get delisted. And they're still bloody good players, but they're just not quite good enough in the position that they're drafted to play. And we've got, we seem to hang on to these blokes. And that's the problem at the moment. We've got a bunch of uh, failed midfielders playing around the edges. Yeah, and we need to bring in those younger kids to give them a chance to actually fail because they're going to. But we're so and afraid you of need failure. To fail in order to improve. We are so yeah, afraid of no, failure, and that's why we play Chase Jones and Jordan Gallucci in the forward pocket because we're too afraid of failure. You're dead set mm-hmm. right, Nikki. Dead set yep. right. That is the biggest problem with the Adelaide Football Club is that we cannot tolerate failure. And my grandma always used to tell me you can't succeed without failure because you don't know what success looks like until you've failed. And this club wants to sit from from 12 to, to 6 or whatever, a nice comfort zone where we still get bums on seats and we're still a chance every now and again when, the, when we get a nice draw or whatever. We are not, as a club, prepared to fail in order to succeed. And until we actually change that, we're going to have the same list profile, we're going to play the same players, we're going to do the same thing over and over again, and we're never going to get anywhere. That's what I think. Yeah, yep, we're, we're just going around. A little, we're going around in a little circle. We actually well, we need to play for 20 step years, outside that circle. Yep, we haven't won a flag for twenty years, and we're not going to no. win another one. Not the way. We, not with the, like our current philosophy. And to me, in got, my opinion, in my opinion, I think Rashuto, for all the good things he's done in the club, he's also done some bad things by bringing too many of his mates as well in the wrong spots. Well, you know, again, it smacks of arrogance, doesn't it? Um, Macca, it smacks of someone coming in and saying, well, I know, I know what needs to be done. And yes, you know, he made a good choice with regards to Phil Walsh, um, but that's one appointment. Um, but now we've got ruse mates all yeah. over the place uh, down there. Putin, you've got, uh, because, they, because they can't attract the other people or they won't pay the money to get them over here. That's the thing. is we have, to, we have to be willing to actually take that tax hit, that football yes. tax hit, because to get those people out of the Victorian bubble where they can earn more money, we've got to pay more money here. Absolutely. I was about to say, Nikki, uh, I was going to raise that point. We had a $3.7 million profit, and I would have been happy to have a $2.7 million profit and uh, Birdman replaced by somebody of a better status and uh, Ben Hart replaced by somebody of a better status. And, and, and uh, the difference between us and West Coast, because you, got to, you could make, on the surface, you could make the same argument uh, for West Coast, that they have to attract blokes over there. But my impression is that if, if blokes choose to go to Western Australia, they're choosing, uh, it's a lifestyle choice. They're deciding yeah. to, to pack up and yeah. go to Western Australia and they'll often settle there. Whereas anyone coming from Victoria over to Adelaide, it, it's, it always seems part-time. Oh, you know, I'm only going to go to Adelaide for a couple of years, and then you know, when a when a uh, like Teague, for example, when a, a a gig pops up at home, I'll, I'll shoot off back home. You, you're right, Nick. We need to be able to spend. We need to be willing to spend the money, and if it means that we have one or two less development coaches in order to pay those senior coaches more money, I think we should do it. Um, well, the the interesting thing though with the Eagles that slightly contradicts that is Sam Mitchell. So they did have to spend quite a bit. They got him over there as a player. They used the connection with Simpson to get him over there. And they they actually banked on keeping him for yeah, a while. I don't think Sam but Mitchell's he's very gone, trustworthy. No. No. I, he's I taken he the money and he's, and, and he's coming back. Hmm. Yeah, I, so I don't they think... Got, they, they got burned as well. But you actually do look at a lot of the, the ones that they've attracted back. Are, so, like, they've got Van Bello. So it is a former um, Western Australian boy. Yeah. So they 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 actually do have a similar issue to what the, what we do, but they also have a lot more money than what we do because of the the structure of how their club was set up. They actually get a lot more money into uh, their football. We we got enough money. What we do. We've got enough money. Yeah, yeah. we we do. They they they've just got that little bit more. Mm. Um, Look, anyway, and, I mean, uh, sorry, one, go on, one last comment about coaches, Camperelli. Uh, Camper really is our midfield coach. No, uh, he's not. He's our senior Sorry. assistant now. No, he's, he's our senior assistant, but that's where he's alleged. But that ex- midfield has got his fingers all over it. 
Well, well, Mick Godden Godden is a first-year coach from the SANFL, and we made this point last week, Macca, that around our our senior coach in in supposedly a premiership window, we've got two rusted-on coaches and two SANFL apprentices and a bloke that no-one else wants. What sort of a a coach's box is that to put around your senior coach when when you're gunning for a flag? What sort of a coach's box is that? You're two SANFL apprentices, and nothing against Marty Matner or Mick Godden, but what can Mick Godden offer the the AFL midfield? What why, what the hell can Mick Godden do insanity. for the AFL it's insanity, midfield? Really, yeah. it's insanity. You and know, you compare it to what? Well, you know who I think should take over the midfield? Matthew Clark. Oh, I reckon. Bloody Chelsea. Look at, Randall. look at what look at what he did with that women's team. But very interesting though. And he's got boys club around him, but it's Caven and it's McLeod. And he brought in Tim Weatherald and he brought in the one of the best actually coaches in the women's game in South Australia, Narell Smith. Hmm. Um, so that's, you actually look at the two coaching panels we've got for our two football teams. Um, and wh- where's the difference? Yeah, I don't know. And you, and you nailed Ability. it. They, they are not good assistants around Pikey. Not good enough. Anyway, look, this is the rap show and we're probably sneaking into Tuesday Night Live territory. But uh, but I, I felt the coaching on the weekend was abysmal. I, I felt like uh, the players uh, look confused. They're not looking as if they're free in their movement uh, or free in their minds. Uh, it looks like when they get the ball... They're, there's some very strict instructions about how they're expected to play. Uh, there's no flair. There's no uh, taking the game on. Uh, there's none of that. Uh, so, I, again, for the second week in a row, I, I'm going to say I feel like we're being overcoached. Um, we pick players for their ability and their ability to play footy. And I think at times you've got to let blokes actually play and I don't think blokes are being allowed to play at the moment. I think they're being too heavily drilled. Well, it's certainly not working if they are. I think so. The point my dad made um, previous week, and particularly watching um, us in the SNFL against Glenelg, was he thought we were overtrained. We're too heavy. That yeah, we did look sluggish. Passing and everything else, we looked so sluggish. But this week, it looked like we'd been freshened up. They were running a lot quicker um, and some really nice kicking. Um, so I when? do wonder whether we in had... In the warm-up? In, in, no, in the SNFL. Oh, in the SNFL, oh. right. I was well, going to say, so not the bloody uh, AFL. Jesus. Not the game I watched. Yeah. <laughs> in the SNFL. Um, and so I'm not quite sure with what happened in that AFL structure because we saw something that seemed to... that. Some freshening up seems to have happened. Um, but, uh, yeah, but, it, but it's in the mind, Nikki. They're, they're, they're shot. To, they're shot is. to pieces. They they have no confidence in each other or themselves, and yeah. and the, they are so they are so intent on playing a certain way, and it's obviously this kick the ball around and try to you know spread the zone. But they're not actually doing the work in order to make that game plan work. So they're just getting themselves into more and more trouble because the, the ground compresses because they're not running and spreading hard enough. So the, the opponent is able to compress the ground, force a turnover and then get us on, on the run back. It, it, it's, they're just not playing like a, like a football team at the moment. It was actually so painful to watch. It was like that Hawthorne game last year. Yeah, it, it, it's painful to watch at the moment. And at the, if we're going to continue... Uh, uh, with the same coaching panel, which we obviously will, and we're going to uh, basically the same uh, team with some changes. If we continue with the same game plan, uh, as Fiend was pointing out before, we're going to get destroyed by everybody because our, our players are starting to drop their bundle because they don't believe in it. No. It's obvious. So you're bringing some new, uh, you're bringing some new blokes, Mac, is what you do. Now, we've got our awards... Yeah, We've got our awards, Breakout Jet of the Week and Wake Up Award. There really is only one award and it goes to the whole team and the coaching staff.
<laughs> you got to cut it off before we get in trouble with YouTube. Oh, uh, well, they don't seem to mind living in, but it's the, it's the Foo Fighters one they don't like. Anyway, look, we've got to wind Americans. this up. We've got to wind this up. It's uh, nearly an hour and a half. Look, thanks everyone on the chat for listening in and also on Facebook for those listening in on Facebook. Uh, don't forget, if you want to support the Crowcast, you can go to aflcrowcast.com and press the Patreon button or you can go to patreon.com forward slash aflcrowcast. Don't forget all our podcasts are available on demand on our website or on iTunes or on Google Podcasts or I, uh, TuneIn Radio or everywhere else. Um, so you can listen anytime. Uh, make sure you tell your friends about the Crowcast too. We, uh, we're really keen to get in front of as many Crow supporters as we can. And on Tuesday night, we'll have some pretty major news with regards to some naming rights sponsors. So uh, uh, a good time there. So thanks, everyone, for your support. Nikki and Maka, thank you very much for coming along once again. Yep, and I hope that when next Sunday we, we've got a, a much better rap to talk about that well, we've got tonight. So and we can only I. talk the truth, can't we? Yeah, that's right. Look, so do I. <laughs> um, just one thing, because we haven't done cock wobble tonight, and unfortunately, I didn't get to lot, watch a lot of games this weekend. So, if anybody has some cock wobble nominations, we're good on Tuesday. Hit us up on Twitter. Beautiful. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and listeners everywhere, thanks very much, as I said. And we will see you on Tuesday night at 8 30 Central for Tuesday Night Live with Peter. I'm sure he'll be in a good mood. Good night, everyone. Yeah, good night, all. <laughs> good night, all.